Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 14 of Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. We have been kind of on hiatus because of exceptions like this. Bugs, bugs in realism overhaul brought on by upgrading my Kerbal Space program to 1.05 and accidentally bringing everything along. Regardless, we will continue onwards with uh, what we can get running. We did finally get it to a state where we think we can run it. Uh, and we have missions to do. Gail Porter, a scientist, is going to take an all-important bald image into orbit. Orbit. Uh, bald, yeah, you know, bald, uh, bald image. Wait, bald mission. Yes, dear, what I'm getting that all wrong. Look, this is my existing launcher. As you know, it starts off at a slight angle so that it initiates the gravity turn off of the launch pad using passive stability. However, as we've seen in the past, it has had a spotted, a spotty record on this. And yeah, we seem to be, we, we did one well and we did one terribly, so let's see. Yeah, it does look like this one is actually stabilizing along the velocity vector. So Gale will in fact be going to space today. Now, while I am risking obliterating this rocket, that is less of a concern than the possibility of obliterating the save file by working with half-installed mods. I think we're going to be okay, but there is still that risk. Anyway, Gale Porter being a, a scientist and not a pilot doesn't actually have the ability to hold the flight control in quite the same way. So, good news is that in Realism Overhaul, we have computers to do all that for us. It's almost like... It's a real space program where the pilots are largely doing, uh, they are to, to flip buttons and things like that. Indeed, the word was that during the original space shuttle development that the pilots really wanted to make sure that they required, uh, you know, crew at the controls and it was laid out in such a way that a pilot would have to manually be at the controls. It wasn't until after Columbia that there was provisions made for a completely autonomous return to base. Although that was never actually performed in reality. It, it, interestingly, it required a like 20 foot long cable to be connected between one control panel and another control panel because it was essentially a retrofit. Anyway, uh, yeah, Gail Porter, on the other hand, is more or less flying this. This is the same design that we've had before. And uh, she's just putting the thing into a nice little orbit here because we have a little EVA mission here. The requirement is we go into orbit, we collect EVA data, data and uh, furthermore we spend a lot of time in orbit. Instead of the usual one orbit, the mission requirements state something like 15 hours in orbit. Honestly, I'm not sure if the life support will actually support that, but that's why we do experiments. You know, if we find out that perhaps we're getting very close to our limit, then we can perform a re-entry. But right now, yes, here we go. Gail getting outside, stretching her legs, recording her observations on her notepad, which is, of course, floating away from her right now. But after this basic mission requirement, Gail wants to go higher. She's heard about something called the Van Kerman radiation belts. Sorry, Van Allen radiation belts, obviously. No, these are, these are obviously a real thing. They're radiation belts. They're trapped particles, particles trapped by the magnetic field. And when they say Van Allen belt, there literally are two different belts of trapped radiation. A lot of people don't realize this, that there's actually a gap between them. The inner belt starts at about a thousand kilometers and goes out to 6,000 or thereabouts. And then there's an outer belt that starts around 13,000, I think, and goes up above geostationary orbit, like to 50, 60,000. And there's a difference, like the inner belt is all heavy particles like protons and uh, you know ions, whereas the outer belt is dominated by, uh, by electrons. So anyway, yeah, she just dips her toe in there, bathes in the, the heavy radiation for but a moment, and then, uh, well, gets ready to return home. She, she can't step outside for some reason. The hatch is obstructed. Despite working previously, it's now no longer working for her. Perhaps the radiation has somehow blocked the door. Uh, I, maybe? I don't know. Is that possible? 
Perhaps the radiation has gone and turned the door into, like, the Incredible Hulk, and it's, like, expanded, and it's now stuck in there, right? Maybe when it comes back down into the atmosphere, it'll shrink back to normal size. Unfortunately, we didn't go high enough to actually collect any real scientific data of note. So, yeah, we'll be returning now. A small burn here should bring us back. We have plenty of hydrazine left to bring the altitude of the periaps down to about 70 kilometers. 70 seems to be a good altitude for re-entry. Thick enough to slow us down, uh, but thin enough that we don't die instantly. Also, you'll note that the mission elapsed time says two days and three hours. That's because having switched over, I somehow managed to put it back into Kerbal time. So that's actually, well, 16 hours that we've now spent in orbit. That would be Gail Porter there setting the Kerbal Endurance record. I'm going to ditch this stage to the side this time instead of straight backwards because, of course, we don't want to run into it like we almost did last time. And from this point on, it's largely a case of waiting. Now, yeah, descent mode... According to the manual, it's supposed to change the offset of the center of mass, but really what I've seen is it just takes the center of mass and moves it lower rather than adjusting it laterally. So I guess in this case, it just makes it more stable in the face of extreme aerodynamic pressure. I'm not sure why it matters, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why they just don't make the center of mass that position all of the time. Also note how the spacecraft is red from heat. Yes, barely touching the atmosphere and it is warming up so that it is red hot to the touch. Uh, of course, this is exactly what you expect from a, an install of Realistic Progression Zero where things may or may not be working correctly at this time because we're in a transition between 1.04 and 1.05. Hopefully we can find some semblance of stability. Perhaps a descent mode for patches. No, just... Oh, what was that? What was that? Something exploded there. There was a bang. Scroll, scroll. Heat shield decoupler. It quite exploded. I like how it told us that it was white because that's very important to know after something explodes. I mean, it's good to know that despite the sound of an explosion near the spacecraft, Gale seems quite happy with that. I suspect that may, she may, in fact, be a, a badass. Oh, wow. Really f bright red there. Yeah, so I during this descent, I decided to start burning a bit of the HTP to try to create a, an offset here. That basically meant that I was trying to hold it around 20 degrees offset to see if I could get any aerodynamic lift off the bottom. So that was all manual, that wasn't because the the center of mass was offset, that was because I was manually flying it like that. Not that the Mercury capsule had an offset center of mass. Ooh, nice interior! Uh, looks like I have installed rap, uh, was it raster prop monitor, or maybe not. Maybe I haven't installed, maybe I've installed some updates here. Never mind, we're just appreciating the angular looking flame as it zips by. Amusingly, I realized that I hadn't actually tested this after the update. I didn't test, I didn't run any more simulations because the rocket had, of course, proved to be reliable in the past. Well, except for the 50% failure rate. But beyond the 50% failure rate, the capsule had returned successfully in both cases, even although the first capsule return had been from a very low altitude. Oh, look, we're coming down over or near to Africa. I think specifically that is the Ivory Coast, but I could be wrong on that. My geography of Africa is not great. But Ivory Coast has, of course, been in the news the last year because it was one of the areas where Ebola was causing trouble. Ebola itself is a really, you know, whole bunch of discussion around that. Wouldn't have been uh, talked about in the 1960s, of course, when we are right now, because it wasn't identified until the mid-1970s. And... Inter there's an interesting story about the naming of Ebola that uh, they originally were treating it in a village called Yambuku, but they didn't want to name it after the village so that um, because it would, you know, potentially stigmatize the population. So they named it after a river. And apparently the word, it was something like Black River, but in the local tongue. So it's actually a pretty scary sounding disease if you call it the Black River disease. That would be, you know, pretty 
you know, awesome and badass, except for it's, it's not an awesome disease, it's a really scary disease, because I do not, for one, like bleeding through all of my orifices, that is not really um, an awesome thing by any measure of the anything ever seriously let's not even think about that i don't why am i talking about this oh look we're about to land i can start to talk about something else and gail porter returns from the longest time spent in space and uh, is not bleeding from any thing anywhere however the the ground the water does appear to be allergic to to her, or the space cra capsule appears to be repelling the water. The space capsule is clearly highly hydrophobic and doesn't want to sit in the water. That would be, that's a really cool idea. The water is just repelling it. Why is this not stopping? I'm hoping it would stabilize, but no, it's just bumping around and adjusting the time warp isn't helping. I apparently have better time warp installed as well. That's, no, no, nope, 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 nope. Yes, no, 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 maybe, no, maybe, 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 yes, no, no, no. Let me out. Let me out. Maybe I'll just jump out and then see if, if her buoyancy is fixed. Because what I need is, oh man, it needs to be able to go on rails because this thing, let's get out of here. There we go, Gale, jump in the water. And, and can we save? Yes, we can recover her. Victory. Anyway, now that that mission is over, it's time for us to continue to look further afield. And I think we need to research interplanetary communications in the form of the Reflectron KR-7. And after a few weeks, we are ready to go again. Arkady Zimmerman is, of course, really uh, wanting to get back into things. He wants to test a new rocket. Now, uh, the first stage on this is standard affairs. It's using the Soyuz you know, four-way engines, and we have these uh, four external boosters, whatever. The, I can't remember what kind they are. If they're the, uh, the Altair boosters, I don't remember. But more importantly, we're really talking about the second stage. The second stage is where the magic has happened. This is literally some sort of... Um, you know, rocket science black magic they have performed. They call it the closed cycle combustion process. Yes, lots of more science awesome stuff. Anyway, ditch these things and I think it's wonderful how they all love each other so much that after we eject them they, they feel they have to come together with such force. They, they long to be together and they, they shatter themselves. It's almost like a solid booster suicide pact or something, the way those things behave. I don't know. Anyway, look, we have some new textures on display as well. Seacan, uh, you know, if you look, there are texture packs for the procedural pa parts that you can make them look all sorts of new colors. Anyway, yeah, so first stage on this is your standard Soyuz main core engines, right? These are the, the Soyuz, which were, of course, derived up from the R7, and the R7 is is a rocket that has evolved and evolved and evolved. But this, this is the S1-5400, which was the world's first closed cycle rocket engine. It burned uh, liquid oxygen and, um, well, it's not RP-1, it's the Soviet version or whatever. Anyway, this was a huge innovation. This was a, like, you know, the bleeding edge of rocket technology. The idea being, of course, when they close cycle combustion is that when you're powering your pumps, you're using essentially a little rocket motor, right? And uh, that, the exhaust from that used to be vented. But when the Soviets got really good at this, they figured out how to take the exhaust and put it back into the main combustion chamber and therefore that thrust wasn't wasted uh, as, as it was with many other engines of the time. So they got much better specific impulse than any other engines running the same fuel combo. And this specific engine, the S1-5400, it was directly evolved into the NK-33, which of course was the engine designed for the N1 moon rocket and then later used in the Antares rocket uh, that just exploded last year. But look, it's really, you know, it's hard to overstate how important the transition was to a, a closed cycle combustion system because the, the efficiency increases, it's only about a 10% increase in terms of, you know, specific impulse, but 
A 10% increase in specific impulse that actually corresponds to a high, a much higher, more than 10% uh, improvement in terms of mass or mass reduction, basically, is what we're talking about. You know, you're not needing more delta V to get into orbit, but it lets you cut down the size of this. Uh, I think this was actually originally used to launch communication satellites. That was what the first kind of generation of this engine was used for. It was used on the Molnia rocket, which of course is well, of course, it's the same. <laughs> it's a Molnia rocket, Molnia orbits. Yes, they're same, same Molnia, I guess, in both those both cases. But yeah, it, it also has the ability to relight multiple times, which is very good for us. But yeah, Arcady is feeling pretty good about himself. He's just flown a much smaller, a much easier to fly rocket. It has control all the way. It doesn't require any weird inclined launch. And now he sits in for, you know, 10 hours or so, whatever the contract says. Three, two, one, zero. Yes, there he's done that. Now, we still have some fuel left and he wants to go higher than Gale. Well, we'll see how high he goes. We set ourselves up, align everything. Note that we haven't even gone, switched over to that little dinky little one kilonewton thruster. No, we still have this main engine here. There we go, getting ready to burn at periaps. Currently moving at 7.839 kilometers per second, and propellant is very unstable. This is a problem. Um, yeah, the engine works really well, but apparently my translation thrusters are not working. So I'm pushing H, and the engine is... Uh, my, my thing isn't accelerating. What can I do? Oh! Oh, wait, wait, if I rotate it... Ah, yes, of course, I can just rotate it. I shall spin it around until this thing becomes stable. I think that might be a bug. <laughs> I don't think that rotating the spacecraft left and right should increase propellant stability. Quite the opposite, unless I spin it really, really fast. Regardless, throttle up and off we go. Um, come on, how far are we actually going to get? Not very far. Yeah, we ran out of propellant pretty much right away. Apparently liquid oxygen is boiling off a little faster than I'd like. I'll need to modify my design to include more liquid oxygen next time. Anyway, look, we want to go higher and further and faster and everything. I mean, obviously, if we're going higher, that would imply faster because this is orbital mechanics. So yeah, just start burning that fuel. That maneuver node was not really intended as an actual maneuver node. It was just intended to get my velocity vector matched. Just about to pass 1,000, no problem. We still have plenty of fuel just watching the Apple apps rise. Pushing higher and higher right into the middle of those Van Kerman belts. Uh, 1.5, well, sorry, 1,500 meter kilometers, 1,600, 1,700, 1,800. Things are still looking good, 1,900, 2,000. You know what? I think Arcady wants to go for 3,000. 3,000 is a nice round number. And it is a nice round or orbit, or a nice round planet underneath them. It's not a nice round orbit, it's a nice elliptical orbit. 2.8, 2.9, 2.9, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 3,000! 3,000 kilometers, and... Hmm. 9.12 units of hydrazine left. Uh, hopefully enough to get us back down. We just need to drop the periap. So I think we should be okay on this. Should be fine. Arcade may not be spending quite as much time in space, but he's getting higher and deeper into space than Gale ever did. Basking in those protons in the Van Allen belts. Look, there's Africa. There's the planes down in Africa. Oh, sorry. Uh, it rains. It rains down in Africa. That's what it is. Uh, there, 3,000. Now we need to get ourselves on our return trajectory to the other side of the world. And let's hope we have enough fuel. Because I didn't actually look at my fuel levels as I was going for 3,000. I was distracted by you know, numbers going up and forgetting about the numbers going down. Two, one, zero, and we are stuck in orbit. Excellent. Not. Okay, um, I guess you guys can come back for uh, episode 15 to see if I can get him home or rescue him in time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.